Book Two, Chapter Four of Kipps by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. One. So Kipps embarked upon his engagement, steeled himself to the high enterprise of marrying above his breeding. The next morning found him dressing with a certain quiet severity of movement, and it seemed to his landlady's housemaid that he was unusually dignified at breakfast. He meditated profoundly over his kipper and his kidney and bacon. He was going to New Romney to tell the old people what had happened and where he stood, and the love of Helen had also given him courage to do what Buggins had once suggested to him as a thing he would do were he in Kipps's place, and that was to hire a motor-car for the afternoon. He had an early cold lunch, and then, with an air of quiet resolution, assumed a cap and coat he had purchased to this end, and thus equipped, strolled around, blowing slightly, to the motor-shop. The transaction was unexpectedly easy, and within the hour Kipps, spectacled and wrapped about, was tootling through Dimchurch. They came to a stop smartly and neatly outside the little toy shop, "'Make that thing oot a bit, will you?' said Kipps. "'Yes, that's it.' "'What?' said the motor car. "'What?' Both his aunt and uncle came out on the pavement. "'Why, it's Artie!' cried his aunt, and Kipps had a moment of triumph. He descended to hand-claspings, removed wraps and spectacles, and the motor driver retired to take an hour off. Old Kipps surveyed the machinery and disconcerted Kipps for a moment by asking him in a knowing tone what they asked him for a thing like that. The two men stood inspecting the machine and impressing the neighbours for a time, and then they strolled through the shop into the little parlour for a drink. "'They ain't settled,' old Kipps had said to the neighbours. "'They ain't got no further than experiments. "'There's a bit of taking about each.' You take my advice and wait, my boy, even if it's a year or two before you buy one for your own use, though Kipps had said nothing of doing anything of the sort. How do you like that whisky I sent? asked Kipps, dodging the old familiar bunch of children's pails. Old Kipps became tactful. It's a very good whisky, my boy, said old Kipps. I haven't the slightest doubt it's a very good whisky and cost you a tidy price. "'But dashed if it suits me. "'They put here this footsy isle in it, my boy, "'and it catches me just here,' "'he indicated his centre of figure. "'Gives me the heartburn,' he said, "'and shook his head rather sadly. "'It's a very good whisky," said Kipps. "'It's what the actor-manager chaps drink in London. "'I happen to know.' "'I dare say they do, my boy,' said old Kipps. "'But they've had their livers burnt out, and I haven't. They ain't delicate like me. My stomach's always has been extremely delicate. Sometimes it's almost been as though nothing would lay on it. But that's in passing. I like those cigars. You can send me some of them cigars. You cannot lead a conversation straight from the gastric consequences of Foozle Isle to love. And so Kipps, after a friendly inspection of a rare old engraving after Moorland, perfect except for a hole kick through the centre that his uncle had recently purchased by private haggle, came to the topic of the old people's removal. At the outset of Kipp's great fortunes there had been much talk of some permanent provision for them. It had been conceded they were to be provided for comfortably, and the phrase retire from business had been very much in the air. Kipps had pictured an ideal cottage with a creeper always in exuberant flower about the door, where the sun shone forever and the wind never blew and a perpetual welcome hovered in the doorway. It was an agreeable dream, but when it came to the point of deciding upon this particular cottage or that, and on this particular house or that, Kipps was surprised by an unexpected clinging to the little home, which he had always understood to be the worst of all possible houses. "'We don't want to move in an hurry,' said Mrs. Kipps. "'When we want to move, we want to move for life. "'I've had enough moving about in my time,' said old Kipps. "'We can do here a bit more, now we're done here so long,' said Mrs. Kipps. "'You let me look about a bit first,' said old Kipps. 
and in looking about, old Kipps found perhaps a finer joy than any mere possession could have given. He would shut his shop more or less effectually against the intrusion of customers, and toddle abroad, seeking new matter for his dream. No house was too small and none too large for his knowing inquiries. Occupied houses took his fancy more than vacancies, and he would remark, "'You won't be a living here forever, even if you think you will.' when irate householders protested against the unsolicited examination of their more intimate premises. Remarkable difficulties arose of a totally unexpected sort. "'If we have a larger house,' said Mrs Kipps with sudden bitterness, "'we shall want a servant, and I don't want no gals in the place laughing at me, sniggering and laughing and prancing and traipsing, la di da If we have a smaller house, there won't be room to swing a cat. Room to swing a cat, it seemed, was absolutely essential. It was an infrequent but indispensable operation. When we do move, said old Kipps, if we could get a bit of shooting, I don't want to sell off all this here stock for nothing. It took years to accumulate. I put a ticket in the window saying selling off, but it hasn't brought nothing like a rush. One of these here dratted visitors pretending to want an air gun was all we had in yesterday. Just an excuse for spying round and then go away and laugh at you. No thank you to everything. Didn't matter what. That's how I look at it, Artie. They pursued meandering fancies about the topic of their future settlement for a space, and Kipps became more and more hopeless of any proper conversational opening that would lead to his great announcement, and more and more uncertain how such an opening should be taken. Once, indeed, old Kipps, anxious to get away from this dangerous subject of removals, began, "'And what are you doing of in Folkestone? I shall have to come over and see you one of these days.' But before Kipps could get in upon that, his uncle had passed into a general exposition of the proper treatment of landladies and their humbugging, cheating ways, and so the opportunity vanished. It seemed to Kipps the only thing to do was to go out into the town for a stroll, compose an effectual opening at leisure, and then come back and discharge it at them in its consecutive completeness. And even out of doors and alone he found his mind distracted by irrelevant thoughts. 2. His steps led him out of the high street towards the church, and he leant for a time over the gate that had once been the winning post of his race with Anne Pornick, and presently found himself in a sitting position on the top rail. He had to get things smooth again, he knew. His mind was like a mirror of water after a breeze. The image of Helen and his great future was broken and mingled into fragmentary reflections of remoter things, of the good name of old Methuselah Three Stars, of long dormant memories the high street saw fit, by some trick of light and atmosphere, to arouse that afternoon. Abruptly, a fine, full voice from under his elbow shouted, "'What, oh, Art!' And behold, Sid Pornick was back in his world, leaning over the gate beside him and holding out a friendly hand. He was oddly changed, and yet oddly like the Sid that Kipps had known. He had the old broad face and mouth, abundantly freckled, the same short nose and the same blunt chin, the same old suggestion of his sister Anne without a touch of her beauty, but he had quite a new voice, loud and a little hard, and his upper lip carried a stiff and very fair moustache. Kip shook hands. "'I was just thinking of you, Sid,' he said, "'just this very moment, and wondering if ever I should see you again, ever. And here you are.' "'One likes a look round at times,' said Sid. "'How are you, old chap?' "'All right,' said Kipps. "'I just been left—' "'You aren't changed much,' interrupted Sid. "'Ain't I?' said Kipps, foiled. I knew your back directly I came round the corner, spite of that hat you got on. Hang it, I said, that's Art Kipps or the devil. And so it was. Kipps made a movement of his neck, as if he would look at his back and judge. Then he looked Sid in the face. You got a moustache, Sid, he said. I suppose you're having your holidays, said Sid. Well, partly, but I've just been left. I'm taking a bit of holiday, Sid went on. But the fact is, I have to give myself holidays nowadays. I've set up for myself. Not down here. No fear, I'm not a turnip. I've started in Hammersmith, manufacturing. Sid spoke offhand as though there were no such thing as pride. Not drapery. No fear, engineer. 
manufacture bicycles. He clapped his hand to his breast pocket and produced a number of pink handbills. He handed one to Kipps and prevented him reading it by explanations and explanatory dabs of a pointing finger. That's our make, my make to be exact, the red flag, see? Got a transfer with my name, Pantocrat Tyres, eight pounds. Yes, there, clinchers ten, Dunlops eleven, ladies one pound more. That's the ladies. Best machine at a democratic price in London. No guineas and no discounts. Honest trade. I built them to order. I built, he reflected, looking away seaward, 17, counting orders in and come down and look at the old place a bit. Mother likes it at times. Thought you'd all gone away. What, after my father's death? No, my mother's come back and she's living at Muggard's Cottages. The sea air suits her. She likes the old place better than Hammersmith and I can afford it. Got an old crony or so here. Gossip, have tea. Suppose you ain't married, Kipps. Kipps shook his head. I, he began. I am, said Sid. Married these two years and got a nipper. Proper little chap. Kipps got his word in at last. I got engaged day before yesterday, he said. Oh, said Sid airily. That's all right. Who's the fortunate lady? Kipps tried to speak in an offhand way. He stuck his hands in his pockets as he spoke. She's a solicitor's daughter, he said. In Folkestone. Rather nice set. County family. Related to the Earl of Beaupre. Steady on, cried Sid. You see, I've had a bit of luck, Sid. Been left money. Sid's eye travelled instinctively to Mark Kipps' garments. How much? he asked. About twelve hundred a year, said Kipps, more off-handedly than ever. Lord, said Sid, with a note of positive dismay, and stepped back a pace or two. My grandfather it was, said Kipps, trying hard to be calm and simple. I hardly knew I had a grandfather. And then bang, when old Bean the solicitor told me of it, you could have knocked me down. How much? demanded Sid with a sharp note in his voice. Twelve hundred pound a year, approximately, that is. Sid's attempt at genial and envious congratulation did not last a minute. He shook hands with an unreal heartiness and said he was jolly glad. It's a blooming stroke of luck, he said. It's a blooming stroke of luck, he repeated. That's what it is, with a smile fading from his face. Of course, better you have it than me, old chap, so I don't envy you anyhow. I couldn't keep it if I did have it. How's that, said Kipps, a little hipped by Sid's patent chagrin. I'm a socialist, you see, said Sid. I don't hold with wealth. What is wealth? Labour robbed out of the poor. At most, it's only yours in trust. Leastways, that's how I should take it, he reflected. The present distribution of wealth, he said, and stopped. Then he let himself go with unmasked bitterness. It's no sense at all. It's just damn foolishness. Who's going to work and care in a muddle like this? Here first you do something anyhow of the world's work, and it pays you hardly anything. And then it invites you to do nothing, nothing whatever and pays you £1,200 a year. Who's going to respect laws and customs when they come to damn silliness like that, he repeated. £1,200 a year. At the sight of Kip's face, he relented slightly. It's not you I'm thinking of, old man, it's a system. Better you than most people. Still, he laid both hands on the gate and repeated to himself, £1,200 a year, gee whiz, Kipps, you'll be a swell. I shan't, said Kipps, with imperfect conviction. No fear. You can't have money like that and not swell out. You'll soon be too big to speak to. How they put it, a mere mechanic like me? No fear, Siddy, said Kipps with conviction. I ain't that sort. Ah, oh, said Sid, with a sort of unwilling scepticism. Money'll be too much for you. Besides, you're caught by a swell already. How do you mean? That girl you're going to marry, Masterman says. Who's Masterman? Rare good chap, I know. Takes my first floor front room. Marston says it's always the wife pitches the key. Always. There's no social differences till women come in. Oh, said Kipps profoundly. You don't know. Sid shook his head. Fancy, he reflected. Art Kipps, 1200 a year. Kipps tried to bridge that opening gulf. Remember the Eurons, Sid? Rather, said Sid. Remember that wreck? I can smell it now, sort of sour smell. 
Kipps was silent for a moment with reminiscent eyes on Sid's still troubled face. I say, Sid, how's Anne? She's all right, said Sid. Where is she now? In a place, Ashford. Oh. Sid's face had become a shade sulkier than before. The fact is, he said, we don't get on very well together. I don't hold with service. We're common people, I suppose, but I don't like it. I don't see why a sister of mine should wait at other people's tables. No, not even if they got twelve hundred a year. Kipps tried to change the point of application. Remember how you came out once when we were racing here? She didn't run bad for a girl. In his own words raised an image brighter than he could have supposed. So bright it seemed to breathe before him and did not fade altogether, even when he was back in Folkestone an hour or so later. But Sid was not to be deflected from that other rankling theme by any reminiscences of Anne. "'I wonder what you'll do with all that money,' he speculated. "'I wonder if it'll do you any good at all. I wonder what you could do. You should hear Masterman. He'd tell you things. Suppose it came to me. What should I do? It's no good giving it back to the state as things are. Start an overnight profit-sharing factory, perhaps. Or a new socialist paper. We want a new socialist paper.' He tried to drown his personal chagrin in elaborate, exemplary suggestions. 3. I must be getting on to my motor, said Kipps at last, having to a large extent heard him out. What, got a motor? No, said Kipps apologetically, only jobbed for the day. How much? Five pounds. Keep five families for a week, good lord. That seemed to crown Sid's disgust. Yet drawn by a sort of fascination, he came with Kipps and assisted at the mounting of the motor. He was pleased to note it was not the most modern of motors, but that was the only grain of comfort. Kipps mounted at once after one violent agitation of the little shop door to set the bell a jingle and warn his uncle and aunt. Sid assisted with the great fur-lined overcoat and examined the spectacles. "'Good-bye, old chap,' said Kipps. "'Good-bye, old chap,' said Sid." The old people came out to say goodbye. Old Kipps was radiant with triumph. But my Sammy, Artie, I got mine to come with you, he shouted. And then, I got something you might take with you. He dodged back into the shop and returned with the perforated engraving after Morland. You stick to this, my boy, he said. You get it repaired by someone who knows. It's the most valuable thing I got you so far. You take my word. Rrrr, said the motor and tuff, 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 and backed and snorted, while old Kipps danced about on the pavement as if foreseeing complex catastrophes, and told the driver, "'That's all right!' He waved his stout stick to his receding nephew. Then he turned to Sid. "'Now, if you could make something like that, young Pornick, you might blow a bit.' "'I'll make a doosid sight better than that before I done,' said Sid, hands deep in his pockets. "'Not you,' said old Kipps. The motor set up a prolonged sobbing moan and vanished around the corner. Sid stood motionless for a space, unheeding some further remark from old Kipps. The young mechanic had just discovered that to have manufactured 17 bicycles, including orders in hand, is not so big a thing as he had supposed, and such discoveries try one's manhood. Oh well, said Sid at last, and turned his face towards his mother's cottage. She had got a hot tea cake for him, and she was a little hurt that he was dark and preoccupied as he consumed it. He had always been such a boy for tea cake, and then when one went out specially and got him one... He did not tell her, he did not tell anyone he had seen young Kipps. He did not want to talk about Kipps for a bit to anyone at all. End of chapter 4